Welcome back to uh, a varied um, session, I hope. Um, a bright session. We've got some very, very bright people here from, again, a very, very varied um, chunk of the industry, if you like. We've got manufacturing and people looking at ideas, you know, with, where there will be oil on hands, and we've got software people. We've got a very, very um, varied bunch of very, very bright people. Let me start on my immediate left. Dave Grannon, President and CEO of Vlingo. Vlingo. Vlingo, voice recognition. Um, on his left, John Bauer, CEO of UBoost. A kind of voice recognition again? No, it's a uh, student reward and recognition okay. program. Mike Roque, getting into heavier industry. Um, transonic combustion. Um, Nitesh Balsara, again, heavy-ish industry, engineering certainly a professor in Berkeley, and the founder of CO Inc., looking at batteries. And then on the, uh, my far left, Hank Coleman, CEO of Open Labs, which is working on Softline, where kids can make music um, collaboratively online. And he's also, I know, a graduate from Durham, the Durham, not the that Durham, Durham or Durham. That Durham, not the Durham, depending on your point of view. Durham and Correct. England, anyway. Correct. Okay. Welcome all. I mean, I mean, first of all, Hank, tell me what you're up to. Well, we, uh, we started off as a company that focused primarily on music. Uh, after the uh, advent of Napster, what happened was is that music became almost a commodity that was free. Uh, the shakeup that everybody has talked about where we're kind of the uh, penguin in the room of lions, unfortunately. We, we don't do anything that's going to change carbon credits, and we don't do Not anything fun, that's... Not uh, fun, you know, we, we, it's, a, it's more about fun and collaboration and understanding. So we started off as, as basically a company whose idea was to build a brand to be able to talk to kids. Uh, my daughter's 21. She's uh, probably in the middle of the barbarians at the gate. When, because when the gate came down, the record companies, which I assume are probably a paradigm for all the industries we've talked about here, they really didn't know what to do. Uh, basically, things changed so quickly and were so dramatic that the basic infrastructure of the music business collapsed. So what does your software let people do? Well, what, it's, it's both the software and hardware platform. Um, basically, what we can do, and we actually will have a little demo of this, I think, later. Um, we can take uh, a child from an educational perspective. Uh, we can take a performer like Prince or Maroon 5 or Reba McIntyre, and we can give them a complete studio effect. Um, there was a gentleman yesterday talking about how a $15 million Craig computer is now sitting in a desktop computer. Well, effectively, that's what we've got. We've got a supercomputer for music. Most music now is being produced on computers, and so therefore we can open up the entire experience, whether it's, it's small bits or large bits, complete songs or loops, beats, and give it to, give it to the entire range of novices to uh, professional performers. So where does the web, I mean, how is it different from, I don't know, GarageBand or other programs on which you can compose music, or just, um, fake instruments on computers? I mean, what uh, do you do that they don't do? <laughs> well, there, there are three aspects to fake, fake music on computers. One is uh, modeled music. Uh, that is, people like MIT and Stanford have gone in and modeled uh, anything from a Steinway 1929 sure. grand piano all the way up to, uh, you know, an accordion. Um, if you give a, uh, a creator the tools to be able to hear things and then to be able to reproduce those sounds they hear in their head, the way right. to do that to give them the largest uh, volume of potential uh, creative tools is to do that on a computer. And so sure. that's what we do. We, uh, we collaborate, we have over 10,000 developers worldwide, we sell the products worldwide, um, and we have, we have users worldwide. So the collaboration piece, of course, is once you have created something, you want to be able to share it. You want other people to be able to buy it. And so we have an econometric model that allows you to upload it to certain sites and actually make money at it. Right. Right. 
So it's like a YouTube for composers or people who think they are composers. Correct. And if you can imagine, I was talking to Bruce Sterling a little earlier, the, the entire YouTube video uh, movement was very, very democratic, right? Sure. And so the entire process of making music, which used to be um, uh, very, uh, very high-end and very expensive, we've reduced down to something that's under $4,000. You can produce records. In fact, we have people like Jonathan Davis of Corn who've produced an entire record on a $4,000 piece of gear. How are you going to make money out of it? I mean, by selling the product or by we, advertising around the website the, the, or what? It, it's all of it. Um, uh, effectively, we have producers who make beats. So a lot of music, uh, like Fergie's Big Girls Don't Cry, that entire song was written on our piece of gear. Well, the, the producer has become also the, the maestro. So you, can, you don't necessarily have to be a piano player or a guitar player you can actually hear sound and be able to recreate sound and make sound without having to officially learn how to play an instrument. The flip side is also true though, in that we have educational pieces that play through so that if I want to learn how to play the trumpet, I may have uh, a Dizzy Gillespie jazz uh, piece that I would like to play the trumpet with. You strip out the track and you play the trumpet track and then you can hear how it actually sounds as if you were playing with Dizzy Gillespie. If I compose something, who, who owns the copyright? Um, the copyrights, uh, depending on how you mash the music up, the copyrights, you have fair use, and fair use means I've, I've done a complete work, and I've put it out, and I've put it up for sale, and then you will pay your ASCAP and BMI fees. Or you can have your one-time use, and that is I want my uncle to hear me play it, and there's no fee at all, of course. Okay. Nitash, very, very different work you're doing. Yes. Uh, I am here representing CEO, which is a startup company trying to make lithium-ion batteries. Uh, uh, as you all know, batteries have uh, two electrodes and an electrolyte in between. The energy is created in the electrodes. Uh, and most sensible battery companies would focus on the energy producing element. We focus on the electrolyte. Uh, the electrolyte in the batteries that you carry in your cell phones and laptops is a liquid like gasoline. It's an organic flammable solvent. Uh, we are making batteries with a plastic, a non-flammable solid plastic. Uh, this by itself would lead to higher energy densities. Uh, our objective is to uh, make small format lithium ion batteries for small applications like cell phones all the way up to automobiles. And the key is in this material which you're trying, which is like a motorcycle helmet. Yes, the, the polymer uh, is like a motorcycle helmet, as Steve pointed out, uh, but yet conducts ions because there are nanoscale uh, ion conducting channels inside this matrix. So it feels like a rock. You don't feel the little water channels inside the rock. Am I right in thinking? I mean, I've been covering industry for too long. Um, and I can remember many, many years ago, people saying, we're nearly there with the battery that's viable. Right. Nearly, nearly there. Give it just a few years. And here we are. Are we really nearly there now? I, I, I think we are really nearly there. Uh, there are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, because uh, for, 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 for one, the, the land, landscape has changed. In the 1990s, when, when oil was a dollar a gallon, there was really no need for the electric car. Right, uh, right now, for various reasons, including uh, emissions and stuff, we absolutely need the car. Uh, the, it's not a scientific impossibility. There is science there that will allow us to make batteries that will run cars. Uh, is it there right now? It's not. We need scientific breakthroughs. Uh, some of them have happened. Some of them are happening. But with the focus that the current society has on this problem, I believe uh, we will solve the problem. And is it, I was going to say Jess, what I, um, what I really mean is, is it pretty well a matter of just trying lots more materials until you hit that one? Um, it's. Uh, it's, it's material development, it's material integration. 
uh, a battery is a, I think one of, the, uh, one of the things that battery companies don't have right is that they don't think of it holistically, like it is a complete system. People have focused on the energy generation in the electrodes, forgotten about the electrolyte, and when the electrode fails, you say, well, I'm going to try a different electrode. Well, the electrode failed because when you put it next to the electrolyte, it blew up or something, you know. And so it's a, it, it's a system understanding that, that, that is coming around that is essential sure. for this whole process. Okay. Mike, you're in, I mean, I was going to say, you're in sort of a similar field, making things a little bit better each time until you get there. Explain what you do, what your company does. You know, I, I think I'm with transonic combustion, and I think we're going to do things a lot better, uh, not, not an incremental percentage, but... Uh, uh, quite a bit. What transonic combustion does is we're dealing with reduction of CO2. We're also dealing with fuel supply issues, and the way we're dealing with that is we have a fuel injection system. In engines? In for car internal, engines? For car engines. Inter internal combustion engines. Yeah. And uh, what we're doing is we will have a practical 100 mile per gallon car in the near future that will run on gasoline, and then why Vinod likes this is we can run on biorenewables in the future uh, cellulosics and have zero net carbon uh, output. Near future. One to two years. Really? When the, bi when the, when the cellulosics are ready to go, we we'll, injection system will be ready to go. So how so. do you get from here to there in two years? Because so, I mean, that, that is a leap. That isn't an inch well, inch. So the injection system is working. We have four-cylinder automobile engines running in the laboratory right now at the equivalent of 100 miles per gallon, uh, 120 miles per gallon UK gallons. Because um, we've got bigger gallons, let me tell you that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we've got to distinguish here between, uh, between US and UK gallons, and I did, I did do that. And at the same time, with that uh, improvement in basic efficiency of these engines, you reduce the output of CO2. So 100 mile per gallon is a, an output of 55 grams per kilometer of CO2, which is, which is very low. And that's in a lab. Does that, I mean, that, can that translate in cost terms to commercial use? Uh, well, it, it can, it can. So in, when I say in a lab, uh, we're doing the same thing that the car companies do now. They have rolling road test beds. You test the engine under a computer control environment. You load it just like a car does. Uh, we'll put a car on the test track before the end of the third quarter of this year to demonstrate it in a car so you can see it go. Uh, but long before that, we'll have demonstrated it on a dyno, a computer-controlled dyno, that will uh -huh. give us the same result. What's the trick? How have you done it? Or is it no single trick? So this, this is very interesting, because fuel efficiency in an internal combustion engine hasn't really improved uh, since Henry Ford back 85 years ago. Uh, Henry Ford was getting 25 miles per gallon in his first cars. Uh, most of the cars today get around 25, 30 miles per gallon. Some of the economy cars get higher than that. But the basic efficiency hasn't gone up much over 20 to 30 percent. Wow. And what I mean by that is you're getting 30 percent out of that gallon of fuel to drive your car. The rest of the 70 percent either goes out the tailpipe or goes into the radiator and is, it is literally wasted. And that has not not improved in years. And what we have done is uh, our, our founder, Mike Checky, is a physicist and he's looked at the problem in a different way and solved this problem through this fuel injection technology that we'll be producing. Can you explain so that even I could understand? So uh, um, existing engines run a very rich, uh, uh, fuel to air mixture, they, they, uh, and they've done that for years because if you run an engine too lean, uh, the reliability isn't good. The engine will burn up or uh, you'll burn the valves and so on. So historically, the designers have always run these engines extremely rich and you, you pump the excess fuel out the exhaust pipe. Right. What we're doing is the way we inject, and we inject at a much higher speed, uh, transonic combustion, there is a reason why the company is called that. We inject the correct amount of fuel, we combust it more completely, and we have much higher efficiency, nearly double the efficiency of an existing internal combustion engine. So what's the trade-off there, and what, what do you lose by doing that? Otherwise, why doesn't everybody else do it? Nobody's been, able to, nobody it. Yeah, been yeah. able to figure it out yet. That's, huh. that's the simple answer. 
Um, there are some existing engines. The most efficient engine is a uh, Sulzer Supermarine tanker engine. It runs about 50% efficiency. It's 89 feet long. <laughs> it weighs 2,500 tons, and it puts out 110,000 horsepower at 100 RPM. Right, okay. So uh, uh, we've, we've taken some concepts and, and looked at this in just a different method in order to uh, bring this soon to market. Just one thought, all the fashionable money, if you like, all the fashionable talk anyway, is about the internal combustion engine being nasty old stuff from the past, the future's electric. Do you take the view that actually the way forward is just better internal combustion engines? Better efficiency. Yeah, sure. I exactly. And even if you go to a, uh, a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid, with a battery, you know, the hybrid people like this because electric motors in hybrid cars are 90% efficient and you're dealing with a 20% internal combustion. But even in an electric car, uh, you still have to deal with batteries and you push off the CO2 footprint back to the carbon power plant sure. that's making the electricity. Sure. So you really haven't solved a lot. Becoming more efficient, we solve uh, two problems. John, tell me about you, Boost. U-Boost is a rewards and recognition system for K through 12 students. The, um, the problem that we're addressing is the high dropout rate of students in the United States. We're okay. approaching catastrophic uh, levels right now. In, dropout from school? Dropout from school. The from life students that start school and don't graduate is approaching 33% okay. in the U.S. throughout the country. And in inner cities, the number approaches 50%. So there is a lot of efforts, a lot of creative efforts to, to, to try to solve that problem. The way we're going about it is we're providing engagement in students' current curriculum in middle school and trying to catch them at an early age, making sure they don't fall behind. We take data feeds of their current performance. So No Child Left Behind is mandated that schools and school districts keep performance electronically now. Um, we couldn't have had this business three years ago, four years ago. But now we can get data feeds of performance and we can, in, we can incent performance with points. Those points then are good for stuff within U-Boost. The stuff ranges from charitable donations, so we're getting kids involved in giving back, okay. um, environmental concerns, uh, iPod downloads, merchandise, uh, gifting to each other, but things that whatever it is is engaging to that specific demographic. And you do that remotely or in the school? You do it online from? from it's remotely. Okay. So it's a web-based product. We're online. And again, we take, we take web service data feeds um, of activity from districts, e-learning companies, electronic student information systems, electronic grade books. Does it work? I know what you're going to say, but does it work? Well, it, the, the, uh, <laughs> You can imagine that um, giving things to students for doing well works. We all have kids. We know it works. The debate has moved beyond whether or not extrinsic motivation is helpful for students. It's absolutely helpful. It's how do we best apply extrinsic motivation uh -huh. and give the tools to teachers to best be able to use that on a daily basis. So, there's projects going on in New York City where they're paying students cash for doing well on assessment. I don't necessarily agree with that. They're doing cell phone minutes in North Carolina. That works for a very small demographic. We're taking a different tact. We're saying you can't choose what's inspirational for a student. The, the big example is in April, we went up with 25 charitable donations that students could use their points to give back. We assume three to 5% of students would do that. The number in the first 45 days has been about 12%. We think oh. that'll approach 20%. We've been wrong every time. We've made an assumption about what's inspirational for a student. The key is you must layer these motivational elements together so that you capture the broadest demographic a student you can, and then <laughs> the secret sauce is you have to change it every week. So this isn't something a school can do by themselves. It's not even something an e-learning company can do for themselves because it takes a very singular focus to engage a child. So how do you mean change it every week? I mean, one week it'll be cell phone points, the next week, and tickets to the ball game or whatever? 
And in a very unpredictable way? Well, it's, it's everything that we can think of all at once, uh -huh. and then more and more and more. But what we do is we add new ways to do it. For example, in June, we're coming out with auction functionality so students can use their points to bid on things. We formed a 501c3 that's petitioning the public to, to donate goods to this 501c3 so that we can give students even a broader range of relevant items to use their points for. Now, this is more on the merchandise side, but you can imagine the nonprofit side, if you're very focused, let's say, in New York City, there's hundreds of nonprofits that turn kids on. You just have to get to them. You have to get something very specific that'll happen from their points. Where do you get the money from? I mean, if you're going to give kids cash for doing their homework, where's the cash come from? In New York City, for example, it would be from the district from e-learning companies. The e-learning companies would have a budget that they could allocate for this. Much of what we do, although this sounds like a, you know, rewards for kids, goodies for kids, much of what we've done and much of what the platform is based on is recognition. Re recognition is the reward. Peer recognition, so it's badges, it's digital badges, it's the ability to get status because you're doing well. It's getting cool things so that other kids think in school that doing well is cool. It's the recognition piece. And finally, it's getting parents to recognize the, the job that students are doing in school, even if it's only incremental performance, because there's nothing more powerful than a parent's approval of a student or of a child. Forgive my skepticism. I mean, isn't it true that the kids who will get engaged are the kids who would have been engaged anyway? And those, we all know those kids who, if you say push, they're going to say pull. And those are the kids you ain't going to get to. Our, our pilot program was in Hawaii. It was for our kids, by definition, were the worst performing and the most indigent. They had to qualify for a free or reduced lunch. And what we found was that at that level of student, they were more hungry for parental recognition than any other demographic or psychographic that we've ever been in front of. Yeah. And it seems obvious, but they were using their points to print out certificates because their certificates were proof that they were doing well in school. And then they were taking those home to mom and dad because it was one of the few times they've had an opportunity to dialogue in a positive way about, about school with their parents. Very powerful. Sure, sure. Dave, tell me about Vlingo. So uh, Vlingo is a startup in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we've developed some breakthroughs in speech recognition technology. Um, so we've got technology that allows you to say anything at all, and we take your voice and translate that into text. Um, and we run this as a software as a service uh, in the internet and the cloud, so people who have applications can hook our service and allow their users to speak rather than type into applications. Um, as a startup, we focus our technology exclusively on the mobile market uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, virtually every phone being shipped in the world today, and I'm not talking we've all got iPhones or Blackberries, but, but feature phones that, you know, zero through nine and star and pound key, the 12 keys, all of those shipping today are little internet uh, capable uh, computers. They're all sure. connected via high bandwidth uh, connection. They have good processing power, good memory, they can run mobile TV, download streaming music, you can get navigation applications, search the web, do texting and email, uh, but uh, it's screaming out for a better user interface. You've, there are these little Swiss army knives that um, are held hostage by 12 little keys that people have to triple tap on. So that's kind of the use case reason. The other reason is simply that um, you know, in the world today with 3.3 billion mobile phones, it's more than double the uh, landline broadband uh, internet connections. But have you cracked voice recognition? When I say to my phone, hello, how are you? You won't say back to me, your, your account is now closed. <laughs> <laughs> part, part of what we're uh, uh, trying to do is, you know, it, uh, your point's well taken. I think the, um, there's probably no area of technology that is more under-promised and over-delivered than speech recognition. I think people saw Star Trek as kids and got very spoiled by this. And um, uh, we've really uh, made our breakthroughs primarily because 
as a network-based system and as a mobile system, we kind of know two things. We know who you are, so we can constantly be adapting to your voice. Just, just to me. Just to you and the way you say things, as well as the community. Um, I live in Boston, and people tend to drop their R's. So if we notice a Boston accent, we can load both your personal, what we call language model, and a community language model at runtime that you belong to, so that uh, the accuracy is far better than anything that's come before, and it just gets better and better over time, both for the user and the community. Do people like them? I mean, it's a very American thing. I think Europeans have stopped using them, this idea of speaking to a machine down the phone, and it says, I think you said yes there. Do people actually like them, or is it just good for the companies that use them? I'm sorry, do people like what? Do people like voice recognition at the other end of the phone from a machine? Uh, well, that probably not, because you get the problem where people get caught in IVR hell, right? The machine doesn't recognize yeah, you, and we know and you're all back about and forth. It. Um, our technology is more focused on if um, well, you've got your mobile phone and, and there's a screen where you can type a text message or type a web search. I simply hold the talk button on my phone and speak. We take your voice over the network, bring it back to the phone, and, and print the text there uh, that would have taken you quite some time to talk. So that's, that's a little bit different than, than sort of these IVR-based systems you're describing. Why do you say yours is better? Why do you say that you have cracked it or nearly cracked it? Uh, so the state of the art in speech recognition is, is what you've been talking about, where we call the airline or 411, and these recognizers that scale to millions of users can recognize just a few words, known as grammar-constrained systems. Um, no one's yet been able to crack the code where I can call and say anything at all and have that recognized and either transcribe to text or take some action. Right. You know, we've got products I can say, you know, give me directions to Fenway Park. It'll go off and launch the navigation application and, and, and start giving me directions. I can say, uh, text message Stephen, tell him I'm running late. And it will launch the application and populate the text. So um, the ability to do that in, in a massively scalable way uh -huh. was a difficult en engineering challenge. Good. I can see the clock going over there. We've got a minute and nine seconds. Anybody got a quick question? I can't see anybody out there. No? In which case, oh, wait a minute. Gentleman there. Um, yeah, to your point, um, I love the technology on the phone. Um, will you be able to, what's that? Oh, Michael Pfeffer, um, Cola Hall Avengers. Um, will you be able to give it commands for the phone? So you can say, you know, text John, tell him I'm running late, send, and it will actually send it? Or is it going to be limited to just translation of the, into the text? Uh, uh, no, Mike, absolutely both, right? So it's both what we call command and control as well as the transcription of your text. So, so being able to, to tell it, send it, say reply, and then dictate your message. Um, we, we've had focus groups, and there are a lot of fun things as these become more personal items. People want to do things like give a, you know, a little macro, make my own command. So when I want my phone to be quiet rather than pushing a few buttons, just pick it up and say shh, and it goes into silent mode. OK. This, I mean, <laughs> our time is really is up, but go on. Will the best music in 20 years from now will the best music be heard in a symphony hall or will it be digitally created? Very good question. Very good question. If you're talking about uh, <laughs> that's a hard one. If you're if you're talking about um, live performance, the best music you'll probably ever hear is going to be in a very nicely built symphony hall. But if you want to carry that music around, or if even better, you would like to use part of that symphony's music and create other things around it, such as film scores or TV ads. The best music you're going to hear is going to come from a computer. There you go. Uh, yeah, the clock has gone even beyond zero. Uh, thank you very much. And I want to say that every time I do one of these sessions, I go away very, very enthused and feeling better about humanity. So thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.